Right. So good evening, according to Singapore time. Uh, welcome to this first ever IOI uh, conference. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, we have to do it online. And actually, fortunately, we can actually have more people attending uh, because uh, you can just uh, join us uh, in, your con in the comfort of your, your home. Right, so we want to thank all of the panelists uh, to present their uh, paper, their talk uh, to this uh, audience, uh, the IOI audience, and uh, also maybe some school teachers. We have sent out all the uh, invitation, uh, but I'm not too sure how many of them will come. And of course, I want to thank uh, Valentina for organizing uh, this whole conference. So uh, without further ado, I will let I will pass this over to Valentina. Hello, everybody. It is nice to hear you, and uh, it would be nice to see you all in Singapore. But uh, however, we can only listen to to our work that we done. We published papers, and the journal is already on website so you can read and now it is possibility we have possibility to listen to uh, panelists to who present who will present papers and uh, we have opportunity to listen to keynote speaker from singapore professor chekit loy uh, who is head of learning science laboratory at uh, Nyang Technological University in Singapore. And he, what is amazing, he is founding member of the Global Chinese Society of Computers in Education. And also he is uh, in advisory board for many years. Uh, he's, uh, he wrote many papers, research papers about uh, uh, computational thinking, uh, computers in education, uh, mobile uh, education, and so on. So please, uh, Professor Chikit, uh, your floor, and uh, we will be happy to have you at this uh, IOI in Singapore. Sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Valentina and Santec, for inviting me to speak to this uh, IOI. So uh, let, let me share screen. Yeah. Uh, so I hope you can uh, see my screen. Okay. Yes. So, thank you. So uh, very privileged, very honored to, to give a talk to this Olympiad, which is uh, hosted by the National University of Singapore. So I'm from the Nanyang Technological University. So we have uh, two main universities in Singapore. So I'm from the other university. So uh, thank you to Valentina and Santec for uh, inviting me to give this talk. So I am an educational researcher. So I will talk about uh, not informatics, but informatics education. So I will share about uh, computational thinking education uh, what happens in Singapore, what are some of the research we do, and uh, present uh, some thoughts and some reflections on uh, how to teach computational thinking. So, uh, so greetings from Singapore. Uh, I understand uh, this, is, this is an international conference. Some of you are logged in from uh, different parts of the world, from Europe, from the Netherlands. So this is Singapore, and hopefully, as Valentina said, we can meet uh, in a physical place in the coming years for the Olympiad. Okay, let, let me start with a kind of a joke. Okay, so uh, there are one zero kinds of people in this Zoom conference today. In, so, so who are they? <laughs> and this joke uh, compliments to uh, from Dor Abrahamson from California, Berkeley. So. Uh, Two types, one who knows the binary system and the other does not. <laughs> so uh, a joke to start off my talk. Okay, so uh, I also want to say that uh, uh, three weeks ago, we concluded a three-day CT STEM conference in Singapore. So uh, yeah, so it was a good gathering of uh, academics of teachers and of students to come together to discuss 
uh, CT and STEM education. So I will share some of the things that happened that was talked about in that conference. Okay, so let me start off with uh, CT practices in Singapore. So CT, in short for computational thinking. Okay, so uh, in a sense, CT is not quite compulsory education yet, as in many European countries. Uh, so this is what we have. In Singapore, we have uh, a program called Code for Fun in elementary schools. So this is providing exposure to students as an enrichment program to uh, be exposed to some CT skills and to do some coding and programming. Uh, mostly is a uh, block-based programming in the form of Scratch. Uh, recently has been made compulsory, so 10 hours of such a program in upper primary, so it's made compulsory. So every kid in the primary school will go through this 10 hours of exposure to visual-based programming, and they might do it with some kind of robotic kicks or microcontroller, so such as the micro bit. So, uh, so that's for primary school. And then in the secondary schools, in the uh, what you call junior colleges, we have uh, subjects. So your subject called computer applications, uh, that is for grades 7 to 10, and is in about 115 schools. So they learn about uh, basic computer applications and some scratch programming. In, uh, we have a subject called computing, so that's for grades 9 and 10. Uh, it's not offered in all schools, it's offered in about 22 schools. And in what you call junior colleges, so that's like a high school, senior high school, grades 11 to 12, uh, the schools offer computer science. Uh, so uh, so these, are the, these are the subjects in which students can learn about computing. Uh, so the 10 schools, junior colleges that offer computer science is only about 5% of the student population. So uh, still uh, just five percent so so a lot more which can be covered okay and in the lower secondary school uh, we have an applied learning program where students can build computing based artifacts okay so so that's what's happening and we also have uh, the ministry of education in singapore are also looking into uh, teaching ct in the subject areas and we start with mathematics in grade seven and eight. So uh, we're thinking about uh, open the possibility for mathematics teachers to teach mathematics in creative ways using CT. So, uh, so at the bottom, you see a quote in the red saying that uh, uh, advising mathematics teachers to make use of the opportunities in the math syllabus and think about the ways you can bring about and stimulate CT. So, uh, so it's uh, looking at a mathematics subject and trying to cover CT and teach CT through mathematics. Okay, so uh, so some schools have done that. They, they look at uh, the four pillars of computational thinking, decomposition, pattern recognition, abstraction, algorithm design. So they use this as uh, principles to uh, teach a mathematics topic you know, to look at students, for example, to uh, create data, create examples of data, uh, and then look for patterns, try to look for decomposition, abstraction, and think of algorithms. So, uh, so attempt to infuse CT in uh, the mathematics subject. Okay. So, uh, so that's what happening in Singapore. Uh, now I want to mention that uh, at the CTE STEM conference that I mentioned held three weeks ago, we had a keynote speaker, Miles Berry. So he was sharing that uh, there are two views to CT, computational thinking. One view is uh, applying the approaches of computer science, CS, to problems in other disciplines. So it's uh, looking, at the, looking at the problem solving approaches of CS to apply in other disciplines. It's a, it's a bit like or, the original uh, proposition of uh, Jeanette Wing when he, she proposes it in 2006. Second one is uh, looking at uh, 
finding automatable solutions to problems. So this again is the, the view of Jin in 2010, where she, 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 she kind of uh, refined to see that, to say that his competition thinking is about uh, specifying the steps to an information processing agent to carry out the steps. So there are two types, two views of CT uh, uh, based, based on the talk from Miles Berry. Okay, based on these views, uh, we, we, we look at the question, how do we teach CT and how do we assess CT? So uh, if you look at the first type of CT, right, applying the approaches to CS to problems under disabilities. So right now, I think what's happening in Singapore is we are trying to generate students' interest in computing through informal ways. So it's informal learning now. And uh, in attempt to try to infuse in mathematics, the focus is really on how, how to help them learn, how to help them learn and generate interest rather than how to assess yet. So assessment is important, but it, it comes later. Okay. And the other approach is finding automobile solutions to problems. So this one is uh, prevalent in when you teach computing, computer science, uh, then you can set assessments, you can set questions, you can set uh, assignments, programming objects, where they can assess CT through analyzing the final product. Okay, so uh, so these are, these, these are some of the ways, some practices we have in Singapore. Okay, so uh, I'm going to share some uh, CT research in uh, that I've done, it, I've done in the recent years, so some research on CT education. Okay, so uh, as, as I was preparing for this talk, uh, I was looking around and I understand there's research on how co coding competitions at like Olympiad can foster uh, CT interest in education. So uh, a quick search uh, helps me to locate two papers. One is by Italian researchers looking at their own national, I think, problem solving Olympics as an inclusive model for learning informatics. The other one is by Valentina and colleagues on uh, learning programming through games and contests. So, uh, so all this brings up the idea that uh, through some kind of coding competition or training, we can foster CT interest, uh, interest in taking up CT as a field of study, computer computing as a field of study. Uh, so, uh, in view of this, so I'd like to share uh, some research we did in Singapore. So, Apple Apple had this Swift Accelerator program, which uh, get uh, secondary school students to come to Apple for uh, three, I think, three hours a day, uh, a week for eight months to, to train them in uh, how to uh, do design thinking, how to uh, find uh, valuable problems for which is worthwhile to develop an app and then get them to develop the app and market the app. So, uh, so they have done this for a few years. And uh, so what we do as researchers is to go in and collect some data on the uh, what do the students learn when they do this accelerator program? Okay, so uh, so there are apps developed by teams of students, four or five students. So these are just some of the apps. Uh, so uh, you can see some of the apps give some ideas what they are doing using Swift uh, programming. Okay. So uh, so this this is really a no notion of uh, getting students to do not just computational thinking, but computational action, because they now they, they now know they can create apps, so that they can take worthwhile problems and try to address problems which are worthwhile for them. Uh, something which they feel passionate about, address problems faced by the community. So uh, it's computational action. Okay, so we did a survey. Uh, in 2018, there was a class of about 50 participants. We collect a uh, uh, we do a survey and collect uh, 20 uh, collect responses. So about uh, 70, 72 percent are boys and 28 uh, percent are girls. So they come from uh, the ages between 13 to 16, and they come from uh, 12 secondary schools. Okay. So 
we use analysis framework to find out through this eight months program uh, trying to take part in this and develop app uh, what attributes do they develop coding readiness interest development science and math readiness design thinking readiness problem solving readiness and uh, uh, communication and collaboration so just very briefly uh, the survey results so interest development at the end of the eight, eight months uh, they become more interested in coding and computer science so a program like this uh, helps them to develop interest in coding and computer science so the rest the rest are just uh, the data presentation of data so a large percentage uh, feel that they're more interested in learning about coding and computer science so that's interest developed and then design thinking so the, a large percentage feel that they can design a, the solution to a coding related problem and design new apps okay so and problem solving readiness so uh generally positive and also coding readiness okay so uh so it's encouraging the programs like these uh, competitions uh, workshops can prepare them to develop interest in coding so this is especially relevant for i guess for uh, girls right so there's always a always, uh, always think that uh, i mean uh, there's also a gender balance so in this case uh in, the, in our data there's no gender difference between uh, what does what the girls gain and what the boys gain so that that's encouraging and we are told that some of the best apps that are developed are actually from teams of girls students okay so uh, some data on that shows uh programs like these competitions uh help students push them for example there's some feedback here i just want to highlight one the top quote the program has allowed me to push my limits as opposed to me to different types of users of coding so i learned to manage my tasks academically and think out of the box okay so uh, so this sharing uh, uh eight month uh, coding program okay so the so this coding program has effects in in six dimensions uh, as i just mentioned interest development coding design thinking uh, math and science to, to a smaller extent but uh, problem solving and communication and collaboration okay then the issue of uh uh how do we teach uh computing so one thing we did research was to how to introduce unplugged methods to teach uh concepts in computing so as you as you know the unplugged methods for example the classic one is the binary numbers right where students carry cards that shows the binary number the, the bits right one you know the in in, in the in, in the uh binary bits is then in order right this is a uh, first bit second bit third bit fourth bit yeah okay so getting kids to do unplugged activities to figure out uh, how to count in binary numbers how to convert numbers from binary to binary or decimal numbers okay so uh so we do research we give that a pre-test a pre-test and to unplug activities we now post test so all this was limited to start with five bits and then we ask them to write a program to convert an, a binary number into a decimal ordinary number and then follow up with a test uh, that goes beyond five bits see whether they can transfer this knowledge okay so the results are quite positive so we develop appropriate designs of uh <coughs> and pedagogies for student activities to help students learn CT concepts effective. So it's not with the unplugged activities, start then with the algorithm, and then move on to the code. Okay. So the results uh, results shows that best. in the pre-test, students do not know about the binary numbers, but in the post-test, they all of them did well, 100%, the students did well. And then there's follow-up test to extend it beyond five bits so whether they extend it to convert for example a binary, a binary number with n bits into a decimal number 85 percent can do that so there's some, some encouraging results in terms of evidence on uh, how you can introduce unplugged methods to as uh to develop understanding before they move on to realizing it in code okay so these are some research results uh i share uh so uh, i move on to talk about some some reflections uh as a 
researcher educator on this field of compute, computational thinking education. So uh, I'll share three slides. Uh, I think I have about 10 minutes left, so I think I have some time to present these views. So the view of uh, should we teach CT for all, so it's compulsory education, or CT for some, or those who have uh, the interest to do it. So uh, I think CT capabilities should be taught to all students at all levels. So even from preschool, at uh, what they call age-appropriate methods, right? Teach CT at age-appropriate methods to st students, uh, preschools, uh, primary school, uh, and uh, students could be exposed to the uh, four CT skills, right? We talk about that, decomposition, abstraction, pattern recognition, algorithm. So, uh, so the, they can be exposed in different ways and they can participate in hands-on coding activities in our school, uh, either formally or informally. So not currently, it's uh, uh, many means to do it informally because it's not yet compulsory. So, uh, so that will be CT for all, helping students to develop interest early on and, uh, if, and uh, exposing them. And uh, but, but for those who really have interest who have, and, and who really have aptitude for this, uh, there are more challenges to assess uh, deeper training and showcase their talents and efforts. So for those who really want to develop their interests and talents further, uh, we need platforms, platforms for them to develop further. And uh, so I, I, I really think that the International Olympiad uh, is such an excellent platform for doing this. Uh, through the concept of competition uh, internationally, you really expedite, uh, stop students to really develop their, their skills further. And uh, competition and communication between students is a driver to promote the comprehensive and in-depth development of CT. So we have a block-based kind of CT education for all, and we also need the, some kind of deep CT education for those who really have talent, and you want to really stretch them further to, to really perform Excel. So the, the National Olympic platform is really an excellent platform. Okay, then the question of uh, CT education versus uh, CS education. CS, of course, stands for computer science. Okay, so uh, so I, I believe that the foundations of CT can be started early. So, uh, and as, as I said, we need platforms to generate interest, fun, and motivation. So the informatics is a good one. Pibras is another one. You know, Pibras is uh, unplugged ways of looking at CT. So really motivating. Uh, and how to bring about CT education so we can foreground CT and coding, teach them as, as basic skills and practices uh, so you can uh, get them to do coding projects, teach them uh, really foreground the CT or you can integrate them into the, the school subjects uh, like mathematics, science. So uh, generally two approaches, you know, teach them as a subject by itself. Uh, I think in some countries they do that. Right? I believe in UK, for example, they do that. In, in South Korea, they do that. They call it computer education. Uh, and, or you could, uh, if the curriculum is really very packed, for example, you can consider integrating them in the core subjects. So, so the foundation of CT can still be built early on. And the notion that uh, we can use uh, different pedagogical approaches. So there's a place and role for an unplugged approaches. So I show some, some research on unplugged approaches that we did in Singapore to, to help competing teachers uh, convey the, the concepts first before you get onto the coding. So the example was primary numbers. Uh, we also did that in other concepts here. Okay, so, and this is a quote from Mouseberry from the very top I, I mentioned. So, uh, coding matters, but it's not the only thing that matters. So there's so a lot of discussion of this in the computational thinking community that uh, CT is not coding and CT is not programming. Uh, CT is the thinking and planning processes that precedes coding. So you have to think, you have to plan, you have to consider how to uh, write your algorithm before you actually do the coding. And uh, according to Suji Grover, he also mentioned that the post-refraction 
after doing the coding, you reflect upon what you have you learned and how might you do it better. That's also computational thinking. So coding helps to develop CT, but it's not the only thing that matters. So uh, the emphasis is also on the thinking processes that precedes coding and after coding. And uh, Miles Berry also mentioned that uh, CT has much in common is other STEM thinking. Therefore, it makes sense to teach CT in the STEM subjects like uh, mathematics and science. Uh, but th 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 then the question comes in, uh, which is about teacher training. Uh, mathematics and STEM teachers, are they ready to embrace CT uh, where they have not been uh, exposed to such approaches? So, so it brings in uh, other challenges. Uh, and... Uh, the advantage, of course, is that CT stamps offer a lot of automatable problems, a lot of problems that lend itself to solutions which can be uh, executed by information processing agent. Okay, so, uh, and also, the, this is my, my last slide for shared reflections. The notion whether it's, uh, CT is some kind of general thinking skills or CT is some unique uh, skills that is... Uh, quite different from other kind of thinking skills. So I want to share some points here. So, uh, so, so, so some people talk about CT as general thinking skills uh, and it's not programming and coding. I think that's, that's very well. Yeah. So uh, it helps to think about uh, promoting CT if uh, you think of that as general thinking skills. Uh, but then there are also other thinking skills, right? I mean, in education, we, we, have, we come across many kind of thinking skills. Uh, for example, we have critical thinking and then we have creative thinking. So, so for example, I, I come to know that creative thinking is a domain in the PISA assessment 2022. So you're not going to assess creative thinking. And then there's also thinking that is uh, uh, put in a, a Bloom's taxonomy, right? So I think uh, uh, some of you will know that Bloom's taxonomy, six levels of thinking, right? Starting from uh, the, the kind of... Uh, memory recall all the way up to create uh, synthesis skills. So there are, also, there are also all kinds of thinking skills in the rules that So me. So, so it's see, see this, some kind of thinking skills as, as in this kind of thinking skills. Okay, so, uh, so there's much conversation that says that CT connects to and overlaps with the, the, this thinking in the various school subjects. So there's a way to try to uh, not, not to say CT is, 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 is so specialized and niche, but actually it's applicable to many school subjects. So there's a lot of overlap between CT and mathematical thinking, for example, uh, which is well, yeah. Okay, uh, so, so there's much, much to be said about CT is uh, the way you see with other subjects. But we must also focus on, uh, based on what my colleague Wendy Wang said, we must also focus on... Uh, how CT can bring about uh, its particular way of thought. What, what is the uniqueness of CT? So I think it's also important how to think about CT as bringing a different perspective to looking at the different disciplines and subject areas. So uh, for example, in mathematics, right, you can think of uh, problem-solving approaches like generate and test, you know, exhaustive search, which might not be which might not be possible in a mathematics a kind of logical or symbolic reasoning process. So CT can bring about a transformative perspective to a particular discipline. Uh, just, like, just like we have many fields of study now, like computational biology, computational physics, all that. So it has bring about transformation, transformative perspective on this and uh, has, has con uh, transformed a lot of professional work across industries. So, so how can we bring about this particular flavor, the value of the uniqueness of CT? So sometimes it's not, it's not brought out, but maybe I think it's important to bring this out as a unique contribution that CT can make. Yeah. So, uh, and this uniqueness is, uh, is closely related to being able to, uh, to find automatable solutions. And according to Miles Berry, this is worth doing. So, so I present some views that shows that uh, some people overkill CT as very general, general thinking skills. So, for example, they say abstraction, right? Abstraction is also used in other subjects, like in English. You know, you have try to you try to summarize a uh, English article, so you use abstraction. 
uh, but it, it doesn't have the kind of unique flavor of CT in trying to uh, think about how you might digitize it, how you might think about uh, automating solutions. So uh, I think there are things to be said about taking a broad general view of CT and thinking about a more unique perspective to CT. So uh, I think in my, in my view, there's, these are still issues that the CT education community are still looking at. Yeah. So, uh, so I think I come to the end of my talk. Maybe I have some time to look at the questions. I want to end with another joke. So uh, three kinds of people in the world. Those who can count and those who cannot. <laughs> okay. So on this slight moment, I think I'll end my talk here. And uh, I want to thank my colleagues, my research team, uh, work with me on some of the research projects. Yeah. So uh, so thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, so I'll look at the questions. And, uh, thank you very much, Professor Chekit. So there was one question about schools, but uh, Professor Santek already answered. I have my question uh, to you. Uh, you, you talked about um, computational thinking and that it should be included in other subjects. Uh, and what about teacher training? How teachers are trained in Singapore? Can you reflect on this question? Yeah, that's so, so because uh, because uh, computing, computing is uh, it's not it's not offered in all the schools. So uh, and it's a kind of a late addition to the subjects that teachers teach. So uh, we we are not as prepared to train community teachers as we are to train mathematics teachers, science teachers, or language teachers. So uh, all teachers are trained in my institute, National Institute of Education. So they go through uh, different courses, uh, including instructional design, pedagogy. So uh, I think there's a, there's a call now to consider how to provide training for teachers who will be teaching computing. So uh, we in NIE have start to offer some uh, in-service courses like introducing unplugged pedagogies to teachers. So we need to scale this up to see how we could uh, train a broader base of teachers. So teachers, uh, the community teachers, uh, they are not, some of them are not, uh, do not have computing as the university majors. So they are converted from other subjects like mathematics and science. So the training provided to them was more on the content aspects you know, teaching them programming. So I think the pedagogy part can be, more attention can be paid on training the computing teachers. So this is a part we need to continue, we need to work on further if, if you have to see a broader spread of uh, computing education or even compute, computational thinking education in Singapore. Thank you. So thank you for question. I do not see more questions. So thank, thank you again. And uh, so now our next presenter is uh, Tom Berhoog with very attractive uh, paper, uh, research on uh, backtracking uh, without recursion. And I would like to say a couple of words of Tom because uh, he contributed a lot to IOI, probably young people uh, do not know who con young contestants, but uh, Tom Verhoek has long history with IOI, IOI worked at the scientific committee for many years. And what is very, really amazing is that he started, he was one of initiators uh, with IOI syllabus that now we all countries are using. So Tom, please. Thank you. And I will start sharing my screen. Um, and this one, share, <coughs> and then play. Uh, can you confirm that you see my screen? Yes. We okay. See. So, yeah, it's my pleasure to present uh, my paper, Lukma Backtracking Without Recursion. Uh, unfortunately, in the uh, limited time, I cannot present the full content. 
So I encourage you, coaches, to read the article and explore the source code. But also, um, it is written for contestants. Uh, and if they don't read English, then please help them. Tell them the story. Um, so about some of the insights that you can get from this paper. Uh, first of all, um, I set up um, a situation where you can discover backtracking in a natural way, even if you're not really looking for it. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. So that is about the discovering part. Eh? So it is not about programming yet. Another thing is that once you have this discovered, this idea, there is a way to implement it. And you don't need to use recursion, recursion in a traditional sense. Um, also not with a loop and an explicit stack eh, where you simulate recursion, but rather it uses self-application. And uh, on the design part, um, so I decided that I needed to show source code to convince you that it really works. I start with a functional approach and then translate that into an object-oriented program. Um, and in particular, uh, what pops up is a design pattern, you could say, for partial function application that I think is nice if you start uh, using uh, object-oriented languages. And then uh, there is also a little part about the powers and dangers of polymorphism and how to reason about that, something that is known as contractual reasoning, also something that I would like to illustrate. So I'll give you an overview of the article and then spend the rest of the time on one little nugget from the paper. So the overview is there are five sections, one and five are introduction and conclusion. And then the main content, section two, explains about binary puzzles. These are simplified binary puzzles where you have a grid of bits. Some bits have been um, set already and you are to fill the empty squares with zeros and ones, satisfying some rules. And we're interested in solving these puzzles, not by brute force and backtracking, but rather by reasoning strategies, where you can reason from the rules of the puzzle what bits have to go where. And then once you have these reasoning strategies, you discover that you may want to combine strategies so that you have strategy combinators that take strategies as parameters like repeating a strategy until there is no further change, until you reach a fixed point, or pairing two strategies where you apply one strategy and then follow it up with the next strategy. And you can combine these, you can repeat a pair and then you can pair that with another strategy. So that's a nice toolbox. Um, and then what also pops up naturally is the wish to apply strategies to strategies that have strategy parameters, and then you can self-apply them. And that is actually a way of yeah, doing backtracking, but you may not even have noticed it. The design is in terms of a, a functional approach, but I implement it in an object-oriented language, and there you need to discover some things. And in particular, what I even found myself um, surprising is that it really works. So to convince you, there is a Git repository with Java and Python code to illustrate that the article explains the Java code. There is a little twist. It works, but there is a surprise. And I'm not going to uh, tell you what that surprise is, but it is explained in the paper. There are two surprises in a way. Um, and then section four is about focusing on the essence. What actually is making this cyclic behavior without a loop or recursion work? And also how to reason about that. Okay, and then I want to focus on self-application and show you uh, what that brings and how it is simple and um, powerful at the same time. So you may know from lambda calculus, a very simple computational formalism that just has variables, not program variables, but mathematical variables, lambda abstractions and applications. Here is a lambda term, lambda x dot x x. And this denotes a nameless function of a variable x. And what is that function doing? Well, it is applying this x, this argument, to itself, to x. And so there is an application in there, x applied to x. And we abstract from the x, and then you can substitute things for that x. There is only one computational rule, and that is substitution 
also known as beta reduction. And if you have an application, uh, sorry, an application of a lambda term to some other term, so lambda x with some body t applied to something else u, then you can beta reduce that by replacing all the free x's in t by that u. And that is just a substitution rule. Uh, there is no stack, there is no program instruction counter or something like that. This mechanism just substitutes, substitutes, substitutes. So let's look at the lambda term that showed above and apply it to itself. What does that beta reduce to? Well, you take the right hand side as an argument and we have to replace that for every free x in this part over here. X occurs twice. So we get lambda x dot xx applied to lambda xx dot xx. And if you then look carefully, you see that it is exactly the same term we had before. So you can keep on beta reducing this and it's an infinite loop. There is no while statement, there is no recursion because functions have no name, so they can't refer to themselves. But through self-application, you do get the loop. Now this infinite loop is of course not very useful. In uh, C++, this can also be programmed very simple. Uh, especially in C14 that has generic lambda expressions. So this term lambda x apply x to itself in C++ is a lambda expression where we need to use this auto type for x because the type of x is a function that you can apply to something that is a function of the same type. In uh, many functional programming languages this won't type. You get an infinite type error but in C++ and in Java, you can make this work. Um, and if you do this self-application, here is the C++ code. You take that lambda term, you put parentheses there, and you put in a copy of that lambda term, and you can run it, and it will give you a segmentation fault. It will uh, bomb out. One other way to look at this and connect it to biology is to see that X as DNA. And you may know from biology that there are two things you can do with DNA. On the one hand, you can transcribe it, execute it as code, like the X on the left hand side in X applied to X. X is interpreted and executed. On the other hand, you can treat it as data. You can replicate DNA. You can copy it like the X on the right hand side. Here where you say, I'm going to apply this X to what? Well, to some data, which happens to be a description of that recipe. But that orange X is not being executed. So how to put that to good use? Well, here's an example of something similar. Blue is something that we're going to execute, a lambda term. It has some DNA in it and an integer n. If n equals zero, we return one. And otherwise, we return n times well, execute DNA, apply it to itself, and n minus 1. And the first argument that we put in is an exact copy of that lambda term. And then the second argument is 10. And this will compute 10 factorial. Um, so the blue is executed. The orange is data that's being copied in there. And inside, you see that this keeps on going. DNA is executed and copied. Um, so... How does that work? Well, actually, there are objects underneath, closures. Also in C++, uh, even though if you work with lambdas, you may not know that you're creating objects. So how can you get rid of them if you wouldn't know lambdas? And you can create a class that I've called prefec, the precursor of the factorial function. It has one public virtual operator so that you can call an object like a function. And it takes a pointer to an object of that same class named DNA and an integer n. The body you recognize immediately because it is exactly the same as in the lambda term, except that you have to dereference the pointer. Um, and then you can create an object of this class, actually a reference to that object. And then we dereference it, call it with that object itself as argument, feed it an n value and you compute three factorial. To reason about this, note that here we have an argument which is an object that has a function. You don't know what that function is doing because this could be from a subclass. It is polymorphic. That subclass could override the operator to give you different behavior. Now, so here when you reason about this piece of code, you don't know 
what is going to be plugged in here. And so to reason about this object, uh, it takes two arguments and you want to prove something. Well, you make assumptions about the arguments about DNA and N. And here I line as an outline of what you should assume about DNA so that you can prove that it computes the factorial. This is not recursive. Here we create a cycle by feeding in that argument. And then you can reason that indeed this self-application gives you the factorial function. So in conclusion, I also point you to some other articles. There is a masterclass on recursion that tells you more about self-application and the basics of recursion. I think also interesting to contestants. An earlier article in the II journal, which has Tom's JavaScript machine with a programming challenge that involves self-reference and also DNA-like things. And another article that I put online recently, but wrote longer ago from callbacks to design patterns, which shows you how you can discover all kinds of object-oriented programming techniques from a functional view in a very natural way. So th I thank you for your attention. And maybe there is a question, I can answer it. And otherwise, we'll keep that uh, until the end. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for a very nice presentation. That's really, it's really amazing what you are doing. And uh, I don't see any questions. <laughs> Maybe people, if people would like, they can write to questions or to chat uh, later, and uh, you will answer, I think, later. Yeah. If you have some questions. So Thank now, you. our next presenter is... Uh, uh, Darion Ostuni from uh, Italy. You have a big team, five, five courses. Uh, no, sorry, uh, oh, sorry, L Laszlo. I'm really sorry. Laszlo will present, then, then Dario. Laszlo Nikazi from, uh, uh, from uh, Hungary, and you will be talking about some beautiful problems. So please, Laszlo. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Valentina. I'm going to share my screen and also start my presentation in a moment. So can you please confirm that you can see my presentation? Yes, we see. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Laszlo and I am a PhD student in Budapest, Hungary. And I'm going to present our paper, which we wrote together with uh, two of my young colleagues, Aaron Nosai and Bence Deak. So as a teacher, I asked myself the question, do I need to teach complex sorting algorithms to young, talented high school students? Uh, and in fact, it is part of a, a more general questions, since there is the standard library built-in sort functions that uh, they can use without knowing these uh, complex sorting algorithms. How much the students do uh, need? Do they need to know about uh, uh, standard library elements? And uh, we could define some levels of knowledge, like the interface of the function or the complexity of the operations, which are required uh, in uh, computer programming contests. But there is also the theoretical background or even the implementation details. And um, right now, we focused on talented high school students. And some of the more goal-oriented students even ask the questions themselves. Do they uh, need to know how the uh, standard library sort works if they only need to use it? And uh, for this, in my opinion, one of the best answers is showing them some uh, beautiful problems where actually the key to the solution lies in knowing uh, particular sorting algorithms. I can tell you an example. Uh, there is a well-known algorithm of counting inversions in an array that uses merge sort. But you need to implement merge sort and include some uh, further calculations in there. Um, 
So we looked for similar tasks uh, where the sorting algorithms are applied uh, as a surprisingly nice idea. And often they are from another domain, for example, geometry problems or graph theory or uh, some nice interactive problems. Uh, and even though our current aim was to point out some tasks when where the sorting algorithms are applied directly, uh, in my opinion, the biggest gain of learning uh, these algorithm is that the students will be able to apply those principles in other situations. So with that, I'm going to move forward uh, to presenting some of the tasks in the article. The first one is called uh, matching nuts and bolts. And uh, it is about, uh, uh, we have a box of N uh, bolts with distinct sizes, and we have another box uh, of the corresponding nuts. And our task is to find the matching nut for every bolt. And uh, for this, we have uh, one operation that we can perform is to compare the size of a bolt and a nut. So this is an interactive task and we have limited number of queries uh, to solve it. So there are some uh, O of N squared naive solutions, but I'm going to go ahead and, so and show you a better one, which is very similar to the quick sort algorithm. So here, First, we randomly choose a pivot bolt and compare all the nuts to it so we can find its pair, its matching pair, but also we partition the nuts to a set of smaller nuts and a set of bigger nuts. And uh, the next idea is to repeat this the other way around. We have the matching nut and compare it to all the bolts. We find the smaller ones and the bigger ones, and then we can repeat this process recursively in the, in the two uh, subsets. So as you can see, this solution is almost the same as the quick sort algorithm, but the two collections are being sorted in parallel. And uh, so then if you know the quick sort algorithm, it's a huge advantage. Uh, uh, for the solution and also for analyzing the complexity because uh, you need to know the trick of randomly choosing the pivot element to avoid the worst case of n square complexity but we here we depend on the fact that the grader uh, the program who answers the question is not adaptive uh, or I can mention that uh, also there exists deterministic solutions which uh, have the O of N log N complexity. Uh, they are a bit more complicated. Now I move on to the next task, uh, which I call uh, the tournament task. It is basically a famous mathematical theor theorem that uh, says that in any tournament graph, uh, a complete directed graph, there is a Hamiltonian path. And we can uh, ask it as a computer science uh, question or computer programming question to actually construct uh, that path. Uh, we can formulate some nice stories around it. I put here uh, uh, two examples. But the crucial de detail is to make this also interactive so that the edges of the graph can be queried because it turns out that you don't need the full graph to solve this problem. You can uh, solve it with O of N log N uh, uh, edges queried. Um, so first let's start with uh, a solution that is basically the same as insertion sort so if you in implement insertion sort with this uh, function as the comparator you get a good solution it, there's a, a image demonstrating it here and you can reduce the number of comparisons if you are uh, applying binary search to to find a position to insert a new element uh, Interestingly, quick sort also works without modification for this problem. Uh, if you take a look at the, the picture, you can see that when we choose an element and partition uh, the, the other 
vertices of the graph into two sets. If we find the Hamiltonian path within the two partitions, we can connect them through these chosen elements. And this is in fact, can, it can be translated to a mathematical proof, uh, a proof by complete induction. So I, I think it's very interesting that quicksort actually leads to a mathematical proof. And interestingly, merge sort also works without modification. Uh, you can see how merging the two paths works. And uh, this means that actually the standard uh, library stable sort function in C++ can be uh, applied to solve the problem. But of course, you need to know the theoretical background for it. Uh, now there is some more detailed analysis, but I'm going to skip it to be able to show other problems. There is one called acute polyline, which is a geometry problem. We are given n points in the plane, and we have to connect all the points with a polyline that has only acute angles that are strictly less than 90 degrees. And I'm going to show you quickly two nice O of n square solutions. One, the first of them depends on the idea that we always choose the furthest point. So we start from a point and uh, we choose the furthest and append it to the line and repeat this again, choose the fur furthest point and append this to the line. So if you look at the implementation, it is very similar to a maximum selection sort. And to prove it, uh, um, the correctness of it, you can apply proof by contradiction shown on this picture. The second solution is if we apply insertion sort, just replacing the comparator with uh, that with a function that checks the angle between three points, it will work. And uh, there is a, a small demonstration of the algorithm. But it, so it turns out that if we have a line and we want to put a new point, we can find it. Uh, uh, we, we can find the, the position to insert this, this new point simply in the line. Uh, here is a proof of it, but I'm going to move forward. Uh, it is interesting that insertion sort and selection sort can be applied, but faster algorithms like merge sort or quick sort are not applicable in this case. So it remains an open question if there is a solution that is better than O of n square. And finally, there is a, a task which was an IOI task, and it is actually uh, uh, designed by Tom, who spoke uh, uh, before me at the year 2000. It's called Median Strengths, and I don't have um, much time to talk about it, but it's a super nice task, uh, and it has several ways to approach it. Different sorting algorithms can be applied. And I'm just going to move on to my final thoughts. Uh, excuse me for skipping some slides. Uh, so we examined some problems and with that, we could see a pattern that quick sort, merge sort and insertion sort can be helpful in many different scenarios, while heap sort, selection sort, and bubble sort could also be involved in some cases. And we believe that the tasks that we present are very valuable for, for educational purposes. With that, oops, I didn't want to quit the presentation, sorry. I just want to move on to the final slide to thank you for your attention. And uh, I'm happy to answer questions now or later. I am sorry. Anyway, I'm going to stop my screen sharing. Thank you, Laszlo, for attracting us to interesting problems. And uh, I saw one question from Hirotaka, but then he answered to, the, to his question. 
And now I see a question from Akto is coming. Uh, oh, it's yeah, great to see comment. you. Do you see? Hey. I, I see the comments and it's great to see that you started thinking about the tasks. Uh, yeah. Okay, so they, they are discussing between discussing, themselves. Yeah. I'm okay. happy to join in. I will read the, <laughs> yeah. the chat. You can join by chatting about this problem. So thank you. Thank you again. And now we are precisely on time. So thank you all that you managed to do on your time. And now we are moving to Italian uh, group of researchers. Uh, so, and uh, Dario Ostuni will present about moving <laughs> online a national Olympiad. Okay. Dario, okay. floor yours. I'll share my screen. Dario, okay. No, okay. <clears throat> just, uh, just a second. Okay. Okay, so uh, hi, uh, I'm Dario, and uh, with uh, my co authors that you can see uh, on the screen, uh, uh, I, I will present this paper about uh, how we moved uh, uh, our National Olympiad uh, online. So, uh, the first thing is uh, uh, to explain to you how uh, our National Olympiad is roughly organized uh, to then see how we moved uh, all the various phases online. So we have our first uh, phase, which happens at a school level, uh, and it happens usually in November, December of two years before uh, a certain IOI that uh, we call here IOI of year N. Uh, uh, but uh, the, 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 the variable in the table is Y. Uh, and so in, in this phase, we have roughly uh, 10 to uh, 15,000 uh, people. Then there is a, a second phase, the regional phase, uh, which happens usually in, uh, in April or May of the year before the IOI. And in this phase, we have about uh, one to 2,000 people. Uh, we have then the, the national selection, which happens in September of the year before. And we have usually have about uh, 100 people. And uh, finally, uh, we have uh, the training camps that are usually three to five, and they usually happen uh, around uh, one month after the national uh, level selection and uh, May of the year of the, um, of the year of the IOI. And uh, uh, we usually start with uh, uh, 20 to 30 people and we uh, go down to the, f uh, to the final four that will go uh, at IOI. So uh, all these uh, phases uh, uh, had to be moved online due to the, pan to the current pandemic. <clears throat> the first phase uh, is, uh, uh, was uh, a paper-based exam with multiple choice and numerical answer questions. And uh, it was administered and evaluated by uh, a teacher for every school uh, when, uh, uh, once it was administered. Uh, so uh, uh, previously, the teacher had uh, all the control of uh, uh, checking the students and uh, checking the answers. But now, it had to be, to be moved online. So uh, what we chose to do was to have uh, uh, a single online event, a single online contest, uh, when, where uh, each student uh, was given a PDF file with the, uh, with the questions. And uh, uh, we then collected the answers uh, through a Google form uh, to make sure that uh, 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 cheating was not uh, uh, as easy as in uh, an online contest. Uh, we um, uh, randomized the order of the questions and we randomized uh, the content of the questions. Uh, for, this re for this reason, uh, we only gave uh, numerical answer questions uh, so we could uh, uh, tweak the numbers inside the question and give different uh, uh, values uh, uh, for the same question to different students. And uh, along the way, we uh, created uh, a tool to do that automatically, which is the random tech. Then uh, the second phase uh, was the original one. It was organized uh, like a, a Facebook Hacker Cup-like contest, or also like the old uh, Google Code Jam-like contest, but with immediate feedback and partial scores. Uh, there were uh, like 
50 regional hubs, uh, which are usually uh, high schools, uh, and uh, for each regional hub, uh, a teacher was uh, um, uh, selected to watch over the contest uh, and to uh, set up the um, uh, how our uh, Facebook Hacker Cup like uh, contest manager, which is uh, uh, Terry. Uh, now that he, that, uh, he had to, move, to be moved online, we choose uh, once again to uh, move the contest completely online. Uh, so all contestants would participate at the same time. And uh, instead of going to their schools, uh, we uh, set up uh, uh, some Terry instances uh, on uh, some uh, servers uh, on Google Cloud Platform. And uh, um, uh, the contest was then held like, uh, 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 like a normal online contest, like a Facebook hacker cup would be uh, held or like a code forces round be held. Uh, we also developed a star plug, which uh, is a, a slightly more general version of uh, JPlug. JPlug is a software to check if some student copied, copied some other students, uh, but JPlug only supports uh, a few programming languages. So we de developed the star plug, which is general uh, for all programming languages. The third phase, uh, uh, is a uh, word structure like uh, an IOI contest, but, but with uh, just one contest day. And uh, uh, we use the uh, CMS uh, f uh, as the contest management system. Uh, so uh, we moved it online. And uh, uh, again, the students compete from their home, but for the national uh, level competition, we chose to proctor them. Uh, Specifically, uh, each student uh, was uh, in a Zoom call with one of our proctors, uh, and he had to share uh, its, uh, uh, its webcam and its uh, uh, microphone so we can monitor what they were doing uh, outside the computer. And then uh, we gave them a virtual machine with, uh, with uh, um, uh, a custom-made image of uh, uh, Arc Linux. And, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the virtual machine would uh, uh, capture the screen and send them uh, to our servers live so we could monitor what was happening live. Uh, and it also uh, uh, imposed all the restriction on the internet access. Uh, also, uh, we made another tool called IOA, uh, OE Proctor for uh, Unipedia Italiana in Informatica in Italian. Uh, and uh, uh, this tool would be uh, run on the host machine, so outside the, the VM, and it would, ch would check uh, if uh, the virtual machine was running, uh, it would collect uh, other information about the system, like uh, if uh, a browser was opened, and all this information was sent to the server for uh, real-time monitoring. Uh, the fourth phase, uh, uh, so the training camps uh, were also moved online. We didn't uh, have to create uh, other tools uh, to uh, make that happen because uh, we could use the tools for the uh, national uh, contest, which would uh, work uh, uh, quite well. And also the need for Proctor, since the, uh, uh, since the number of people who participated is less, uh, the, uh, the work for Proctor was also lower. Uh, so, uh, what uh, we want really to say with this presentation is that uh, to move our uh, Olympiad online, we developed uh, these four tools, uh, which uh, we think are, uh, would be really useful other, uh, also for other nations. Uh, so, uh, just to recap, we have uh, Random Tech, which uh, uh, is a program that, uh, given some uh, uh, questions for a paper-like paper -like based exam, uh, can randomize the order, um, randomize the, uh, the numerical values and compute the right answer for, for each uh, question, and uh, generate uh, unique PDF files uh, for all uh, of the contestants. We have uh, Terry, which is uh, a Facebook Hacker, -like, uh, Facebook Hacker Cup like contest manager, uh, with, but with immediate feedback, uh, and it also supports uh, partial scores. And uh, this, uh, uh, we think, could be used uh, uh, to help the um, 
uh, code forces like uh, contest but without uh, so much uh, uh, computing power needed on the server because the server only needs to check if uh, an answer computed on the contestant's machine is right so it has uh, 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 much less uh, uh, computing, wire, uh, computing power requirements on the server. Uh, then there is Starplug, which is uh, a programming language agnostic tool to check for, uh, 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 to check for uh, uh, plagiarism. Uh, it, um, uh, it uses uh, um, a slight modification of the Levenstein uh, instance. And last, there is uh, uh, OE Proctor. Uh, these uh, all the, uh, the the last trees are published and they're open source and they're free software and they're published on, on GitHub on those those links that you can see on the screen. Uh, for OE Proctor, we chose not to publish it because uh, it would uh, hinder its function uh, since uh, uh, it uh, uses a bit of uh, uh, security by obscurity. And so, uh, if you want to uh, know more about it, uh, you can ask us uh, by writing at that address. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Dario. And uh, now we got one question. Mm -hmm. uh, can you read yourself? Or? Uh, and I think I yeah. uh, cannot, uh, if you can read Okay, it. Uh, were there any issues with real-time proctoring, webcam, screen capture, connections to VM, etc., due to bandwidth capacity? Um, there wasn't uh, much data issue on uh, bandwidth capacity. There were many issues about the stability of the connection of the contestants. There were... Uh, a small number of contestants uh, uh, which interconnected connection would uh, often crash. Uh, and so we uh, prepared as, as much uh, as possible for it uh, by um, allowing uh, for uh, queuing uh, before sending the technical time. But uh, of course, when ending an online contest, uh, if a student has uh, a connection so bad that it crashes every few minutes, uh, there is not much uh, that we can do about it. But for the, but for the server side, there weren't uh, uh, bandwidth uh, issues. Okay, thank you. There is one more question, but I think it is what about the benefits of uh, star plug our GP lag? But it's uh, over jet lag. Uh, J plug only supports uh, um, a few number of uh, programming languages. Uh, I think C plus uh, plus. I think Java and. Uh, a few others. Uh, Starplug instead uh, is language agnostic. Uh, it, ca it can work uh, with uh, any programming language. And the last question, there is Israel documentation for Starplug. Uh, is there documentation for Starplug? Uh, not yet, uh, but uh, we will work on it. Okay, so thank you Mario, again and now thank you. Uh, we will invite uh, Jamaladin Hassano and uh, will talk about very long, very long title, but with, with on, on real time and post contest data to improve contest organization and so on. Please, Jamal. Well, I cannot start the video. Yeah, it says that I cannot start. Please, no. Professor Santek. Uh, can I? So it says that I cannot start the video. Okay, okay. Just Professor Santek, please. Hello. Okay. Do you see my screen? Meanwhile. Yes. yes. Now we see. Okay. Let me close. Okay. And. Yes. Perfect. Um, and then I need to turn. Do you see the video? The video is there. I so I lost the uh, oh yeah. Hello everyone, greeting. Uh, and uh, as you said, I'm going to uh, to introduce this uh, long named uh, work, which is about the using the post contest data 
and to get some knowledge from it. And <clears throat> so which is done by myself and two master students. And by the way, uh, I, I was a uh, HTC of uh, IY 2019 and I done the Bagiev was also the HTC member, as you know, the ADA University, which we are all uh, part of, uh, was hosting it. Uh, and it, uh, actually, this is a part of our team. And so what was the idea? Uh, in IOI, actually, we are lucky that we have all the data. So all the things are recorded, in our words, logged, like all the contestant requests, all the uh, submissions, so everything, when we start, when we finish the contest. So when we compare to other Olympiads, uh, international Olympiads, we are quite lucky in terms of that. So the question was, what if we use this post contest data as so all the logs and understand what happens and if everything is okay or if we had something uh, problematic and then we can infer uh, the information from the given data and then convert it to the knowledge and get the uh, corresponding activities for the future. So this idea was supported by the IOI grant in 2020 and also the, all the computational resources that have been provided by uh, ADA's Center for Data Analysis Research. So we use, for the first phase, we used the, the IOI 2019 data. And we made analysis on four uh, dimensions, on four uh, directions, to be correct, on the submissions, contestant requests, uh, working on the tasks, and team perform performance. I'm going to go over each of them and then describe shortly. So uh, by the submissions, uh, we see, we, we uh, analyze data and uh, then represented it in such a way. So you know that, each day we get three tasks, three problems. So here we can see shoes, rect, and split uh, problems. Uh, the dash, the blue line shows the number of submissions, uh, total number of submissions for the given half an hour. So here with the data is grouped for half an hour. For example, for 10.30, we see that we have approximately 350 submissions. By the dashed orange line, we see the number of success of, of, uh, among those submissions. So if somebody scored more than zero, we uh, uh, assume that it is uh, successful. So what we can infer from here, we can see that uh, actually shoes, it seems that it was a quite a... Uh, the, the the task with the, the average complexity because uh, starting from the from the beginning of the contest uh, contestants start to score something and we see that this difference between two lines they almost do not change uh, until the end of the uh, contest so you probably saw from the explanations uh, from the live broadcast that it was a grid algorithm and actually it wasn't that hard to solve this problem so but when we look at the rect we can see that this difference is getting bigger close to the end and when we look at the split we can see that things are getting more and more challenging so the same thing is uh, when we come get it for this day two, we can see the same structure. So one easy task, one average, and one complex. And uh, actually, this is what scientific committee tries to do usually, and they try to find one quite achievable and above the average task and then some medium task and then one hard task close to the heart so to have a good distribution of the tasks and they i asked my colleague from the hsc and he said that yes they have some predictions described as a table percentages and so on and so such an analysis could be a, a good tool to analyze what's happening in real time and also to analyze if the forecast uh, corresponds to the to the reality. So the next uh, direction was the contestant request. So uh, the, during the contest time, the contestants uh, 
continuously ask for something. So we analyzed all these requests and this graph shows it for day one. So what we can see here, I will start with the clarifications, blue line. You can see that in the beginning of the contest at 9.30, so again, we have a grouping by 30 minutes. The, we have a peak of the clarifications, which is quite normal. So in the beginning, they ask uh, task-based questions and some uh, technical questions and some other clarifications. And then we can see some other peak close to the midday. So the same thing is about the paper request, which is orange dashed line. Uh, the, you can see that we have uh, the, the water request, which is zero close to the uh, till the 10 because we had all of the, the water bottles on the table and then close to the, the midday we have the increase of it. And then the same thing is about the snack. One strange thing can be observed here, uh, which is mentioned in the paper as well and described in a detail. Uh, on day one, uh, I got uh, some alerts from my teammates from the HS, uh, HSC saying that we have big queues uh, in, uh, for the restrooms. And actually, the venue that we have been using was like designed for the events, which is which would exceed IOI for many times and we had enough uh, restrooms and the location was closed so this behavior was kind of abnormal so this peak around 130 requests from 10 to 11 to 11 30 was kind of ab abnormal back then we we realized what was the problem and uh, but now I would like to show it uh, numerically uh, so the actual the problem was that the, the poor contestants they would order banana and then after eating banana they would drink water and then the things would happen and so when we analyzed made a sequence analysis between the the different requests like all types of snacks and then the the follow follow the restroom request so we got the number. So the rule was uh, the each type of the request and the number of cases when within the 30 minutes, the restroom request was done. So here we see that for day one, we have a peak for the water, which is uh, which can be explained. But banana is not the, the normal case. Uh, so this is for day one and the others Probably they can be explained, for example, they eat chocolate, chocolate bar for the, with, with the water. And uh, so what we did, we actually removed banana for the day to replace it with the uh, apple. And then we can see that the number, so we didn't have banana for day one, and we didn't have apple for, the, uh, we didn't have banana for day two, and we didn't have apple for day one. We got, uh, we see that number has decreased. And imagine if we had something like this, and if we could see such a, an increasing trend, we could see uh, uh, the, this problem beforehand. So um, the, on day two, you can see that now we do not have such a peak, and this uh, level is quite normal for the, the restroom request. Now coming to another interesting problem. So that was my favorite question, working on the problems. So how do contestants work on problems? Actually, this is the thing that we do not know. We partially know it, and uh, but we have all the data, how they submit it, how, uh, what they submit and so on. And I had one question, how often they switch from one task to another? How much time they spend on each task? And what is the strategy of the gold medalist, for example? And by the way, here is the second guy uh, in the ranking, Ildar, from Russia. And so, and I remember that I asked uh, my colleague, Martin Maresh, on uh, how he, uh, what was his strategy, because he was three-time gold winner. And he said that he would work on one task and then switch to another. So we also analyze this one, the task switches. So here we have only gold medalists. And we can see that, first of all, they do not have a strategy on choosing the first task to solve. For example, like uh, shoes, 
the purple one was the easiest task we, we saw but they didn't start from it so they probably randomly or by the order took the, any task and start working on it and here you can see that they do one task for example benjamin is the first then switch to another then does the third and then only once returns to the red and then only once returns to the uh, uh, black so you can see the same pattern so the same thing happens on day two and it proves that there is a pattern there is an approach and so which is the order of the task is not important to start from the easy hard and so on and it switches shall be minimalistic so when we zoom into the problem we can so and analyze the time spent on a task we can see so here on the left we have day one on the right we have day two we see that the behavior of gold and silver it was almost the same so they spent up to two and a half hours uh, per task maximum that amount of time the average was uh, close to one hour uh, bronze winners behaved uh, also close but they had wider range but we see that for non-winners so the guys who couldn't get any medal uh, we have the guys who spent the whole time to one task so let's see what happened on data we can see the work of the uh, coaches so by analyzing this they adapted and we can see that gold silver and bronze guys they almost have the same pattern so uh, the same range if we uh, do not count the outliers and also the others who couldn't score anything so couldn't get a medal sorry uh, the range here also decreased when we analyze it from the task switch in the paper i describe what the task switch is so task switch is counted when you get back to the same task so if you spent uh, if you worked on a task once then it's there is no task switch if you had four time um work then one of them is a task switch here we see that the goals they have the another task switch and the silvers they have like up to 17 tasks uh, task switches but again we see the adaptation to the, the day two they understand that something was wrong and then adapted the strategy so and here we see that the 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 task switch is, is very close to the, the the one or zero so the next is the team performance we usually see the ranking and the names of the unique uh, contestants but we never analyze the or mention the teams we see it we could get statistics we see it to the flags and so on but uh, analyzing teams are very is very important because uh, there is a work of the coach and uh, there are the activities done behind the scenes and so if we compare a country that gold got uh, four medals one gold one silver and uh, two bronze to the country that got uh, four bronzes which one is better so is the big variation a, a good thing or the the short small variance is, is a good option so we also sorted all the countries by the highest level and here we can observe some very interesting things so here we have medals we can see the gold line shows the uh, the level of gold the, the, we can see silver and the bronze so in this case we see usa and then we have russia so here we see that all of them they got uh the gold but the top was less than the usa if we without stating the name of the country so which one is better so this one with the smallest variance or the another one with the highest variance so what you may ask what is the the matter so the as a conclusion uh, we will mention it uh the team members that uh, keep almost the same standing or steadily increase their overall position from one year to another uh indicates that they the that country that team has a systematic approach uh, they have fair and decent nationals trials selection processes preparation camps 
preparation, uh, participation in other contests, online contests, and so on. And uh, we also uh, saw that the organizational process uh, can be refined uh, by looking at the, the logs of the contestants. So in uh, IY 2009, we uh, managed to group all the, all the requests by adding the text to each of them, and therefore we could easily find and group them. And uh, also, we, you can, by observing the previous contest and looking at the numbers, you can do some uh, uh, preset activities like putting papers uh, on the tables before the contest or putting water so such that you do not have that many water requests in the beginning and uh, for the scientific committees the dynamics of the task submissions in the previous years might be analyzed for its efficient types task type selection and the creation of the test cases and so on and also coaches, they can use this data to analyze the behavior of the successful contestants and team, and these things should not be hidden from the others. So what we do currently, uh, we have finalized the web application that is going to be pushed uh, to the to Git, uh, GitHub repository, which uh, can be config configured to connect to your database, CMS database, and show these statistics in live mode uh, during the contest. And currently we are analyzing the code evolution. So the, another uh, question is, how do gold medalists, successful contestants, submit their code? Do they dramatically change their code or they do some small additions? What are the additions and so on? And the, the, the last one is the code similarity analysis. It's quite a challenging task. It is done for the plagiarism, uh, but for the contest scope, it, 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 it is uh, different. So I was conscious about the time and uh, thank you. And if you have any questions, welcome. Thank you. We do not have no uh, time for questions. And uh, if you have questions, just write in chat and uh, Jamal is going to answer. And now our next presenter is Zhuja Pluhar, Extending Computational Thinking Activities. Zhuja. You are welcome. Okay, thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Just a moment. I hope you can see it. Can you see my presentation? Yes, Zhuzha. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then uh, my name is Zhuzha Puhar. I'm from Hungary, from Budapest, from the Ötös Lorant University. And uh, I am working in a special group, uh, Tate Lab, uh, where we do research is in topic of computational thinking and computer science in education, how we can use uh, computer science not only in computer science education and we would like to give experience and motivation of learning. I think it is the basic of uh, competition later for programming competition as well. I hope you know the Babras initiative. In 10 minutes I wouldn't introduce it but you can read the references later. Uh, we started, Hungary started to work in Bebras in 2010. Uh, besides the main Bebras course, the Hungarian organizers have country-specific goals, such as showing how big, interesting and colorful the computer science world is. We would like to motivate children to be open to computer science problem, so problem solving and thinking. Uh, we would like to help teachers make informatics education more colorful and understandable. And we would like to give ideas to teachers for school and after school activities. We know that each student has a different growth score. Those motivation, in, uh, motivation initiatives can help to motivate students and to find motivated students who later can participate in programming competition like IOI 2. Uh, 
To achieve the main aims of the Hungarian Babras, we need to extend the challenge and use unplugged and project-based activities. And we define the following basics to do this. Uh, first, the use task needs to be funny, motivating, and need to include as so many topics in computer science as possible. Then the extension activities need to have a meaning and should be helpful to solve the problem. Uh, each activity needs to be a physical activity, doing something with hands and body. And the activities in a challenge pack need to be varied and uh, be motivating to solve. We would like to show the whole uh, part of computer science, not only small uh, parts from it. And aim is the tasks need to have the same attribute as in the basic challenge that is the, in the Bebras that participants don't need to have previous knowledge to solve them. Tasks can be solved in a few minutes and uh, they need to be interesting, motivating. And the ideas can be changed. Uh, task can be used in modified order. It will be no problem if a task is removed or changed to another one. And we would like to uh, give a tool for a teacher that they can prepare uh, in the school and they don't need to buy big expensive things. The cost should be low. Uh, and the challenge is usable for several ages. Uh, it means that, of course, in the same time, we can play it with several uh, students from several ages as well. Uh, and of course, then we need a coordinator who can help or who can change the task, the basic ID in the background. And the game need to be played by students and students groups as families as well. Uh, I like uh, competition and, and uh, activities better if the students can cooperate, they can communicate with each other and discuss uh, what they would like to do and why they need to give a reason. Uh, I prepared first a pilot, a pirate uh, treasure game with four small tasks. And we tested it on open days and family days with university students and with families as well. And then uh, I prepared this uh, suitcase, the first version of this suitcase. It contains the used tools with printed and laminated instructions and guidelines. The expanded tools are created as a DIY project. The teachers and the students themselves can prepare their own versions. Uh, in this year, we had a second um, uh, round in the Bebras and the group prepared uh, their own uh, game from a Beberas task as well. Uh, I think it is not uh, fair from the uh, uh, thinking of the students and the, and the teachers. Uh, and the basic challenge game is defined with 12 station, 12, 12 ex uh, activities, but in the pack I prepared uh, 15 tasks and that can be used in different orders. And we started to develop more new activities that can be put into the suitcase and renew the game. We can renew the game again and again. Uh, each station has an activity that can be solved in maximum 10 minutes with support at least. Each station needs to have because of this coordinator who reads the station, gives small instructions and help, and uh, resets the original, uh, original state when the group leaves. And then a new group can come.
Uh, the coordinators can tell stories about the task. It is very important that we have a connection uh, to the computer science and other disciplines, for example, literature or history or um, engineer sciences or, or other, other, really other sciences as well. Or we, we need to have uh, connections to the real life as well. Uh, the prepared guidelines of activities contain always a poster with the story, uh, with the ta task instructions, uh, then a printable materials that we can print out, cut, laminate. Uh, the original, and, and we have a paper where you can find the original state of the activity defined for the several age groups, uh, helping questions or instructions defined for the age groups that the coordinator can uh, use later. Uh, it contains the interesting facts and the topic of computer science and connections with other disciplines or the real life. And of course, ideas for variations uh, with comments. It means that, of course, you can extend this basic station, this basic activity for more complex or for other age groups or for other activities in a, and other environment as well. Uh, of course, I will publish the set, uh, the suitcase. I would like to publish it. No, we have it, it only in Hungarian, but I would like to find sponsors and then we can translate it. And we would like to prepare a set where you can really only uh, download, print out, and you don't need to buy uh, the things as well. But of course, I would like to prepare a version where you can buy all the things as well. Now, if we have uh, some time, then I can show you some prepared tool. As for example, I don't know if you can see in the camera, we have crocheted beaver burgers, Valentina knows this task, I think. We have beaver burger with cheese and, and other things. Or uh, if you would like to play Sudoku, then we have this small things to play with. We have candies. I try to show it to the camera. I'm sorry. We prepared candies. I prepared it with my children together. Uh, yes, and um, I would like to answer your question. If you have, of course, you can uh, read my email address okay you can write me and if you if you are interested and, and I, I will answer as well okay thank you thank you Georgia uh, so for your presentation and uh, so I do not see any questions in chat but maybe if you get later you will answer thank you and uh, so Please stop your presentation because now we are going to invite Martin Marish with very short uh, uh, title of his paper, Security of Grading Systems. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, greetings from Prague, Czech Republic. First of all, I would like to thank for inviting me to the conference and the topic of my of my talk will be security of grading systems so let's consider a contest system with automatic grading like the ioi the contestant submits some source code and the source code is run automatically through a grader whose goal is to test the solution test whether it's correct based on some test data and also to make sure that the solution fits in some resource limits, like time limit, memory limit, and so on, with the goal of awarding more points to more efficient solutions. However, some contestants don't play fair. They tend to seek advice from 
forbidden outside sources, and they also try breaking the integrity of the grading system. And that will be the topic of our talk. I would like to investigate some attacks on grading systems, both attacks which were seen at real contests, and also some hypothetical attacks. And of course, I would like to suggest some defenses against these attacks, not only in the implementation of cadres, but also in the overall organization of a contest. This topic was already investigated by Michal Frischek in 2006, but in the 15 years since that, a lot of things have changed. So, the first, of, the first class of ethics I would like to discuss are general of service ethics. These are most, the most trivial ones. And, well, uh, with these, the contestant can gain no real advantage, but still, it can introduce a lot of problems. So, there are some denial of service attacks based on exceeding resource constraints, like the time limit. You can write an infinite loop. You can write an infinite loop which is allocated in memory all the time. Of course, when the contest system is properly configured, these will be trivially stopped by the time and memory limit on the task. But uh, if you have multiple processes or threads enabled, for example, because you need to run Java, you can also submit a frog port. That's a program which is, uh, which is continually creating new processes or threads. And if your time and memory limit is on thread, this can easily overwhelm the whole machine. So in order to guard against, against these, you need some global limits on the resources. On current Linux systems, uh, the best mechanism for that is probably the mechanism of control groups. Of course, you can also fill up disk space. Many contest systems forget about this issue. And independent of the time and memory limits, you also need to, to set some file system quota for the output. Or, or, well, for any directory which is writable by the solution. You can also mount very similar attacks in compile time. You can write a C++ program which has nested templates whose expansion grows exponentially with the size of the source code. You can also try including, let's say, dev0, which gives an infinite stream of zero bytes. And this will easily fill up all the available memory because the compiler will try to buffer a line of input. But in, in this case, the line is infinitely long. Also, you can make the, make the compiler produce, produce an executable file having several gigabytes of size by just a single line, which defines an array, which is huge, but only partially initialized. Let's say you initialize just the first item of the array. The solution of all of this is to use proper sandboxes not only for execution of the solutions, but also for the compiler. Then there is the issue of uh, in process graders. For example, at the IOI, tasks define an API where one side of the API is implemented by the contestant and the other by the grader. But both pieces are linked to a single executable. So, they, so when executed, they share other space. So you have a secret boundary inside a single process. This can be an issue, for example, in an interactive task, where, let's say, that the solution is guessing a number generated by the grader. So the API is some function implemented by the contestant and a query implemented by the grader. But inside the grader, there is a limit on the number of queries and also the secret number to guess. And these things live in the same other space as the contestant solutions. Of course, there is a lot of attacks which can try to access or change the internal state of the cater. For example, you can, you can let the linker link symbols in your, in your solution with the symbols defined inside the cater. You can override the symbols of the cater. You can even override standard library functions called by the cater. This is really hard to defend from. You can also try rolling back the grader state. For example, you can try to copy all memory used by the grader to a different space and then restore it back so that you can reset the number of queries to the original state. 
Well, even easier, if you have multiple processes permitted, you can use the forexes call to create a copy of the process, which also includes a copy of the state of the cater. And then you can just switch to this different process and continue the condition there. And in fact, this is almost impossible to defend from. So, well, as long as everything is executing in the same other space, so you must assume that nothing in the same other space as gather can be trusted. So you need to have two separate processes, one with a solution and one with the code of gather, which is used to judge correctness of the solutions. And then the API just wraps the entire process communication to make it comfortable for the, for the contestants. Then there are several possibilities of creating cover channel to transmit some information which shouldn't be available to the contestant. For example, in many contest systems, it happens that the file system contains some secrets like the correct output files. And of course, during runtime, the solution can read these files, but uh, it, it can be more subtle. You can do that also during compilation. The Ingbin assembly language directive, which can be used from C code, can be used to embed an arbitrary file and file system to the, to the program being compiled. So you need to keep a tight sandbox and li which limits access to files, not only in runtime, but also the compilation. Also, you can use the feedback given by the coding system, the verdict, to leak some information on the test data. Uh, in the paper, we have a simple model situation with quite reasonable parameters in which you can extract 13 bits of data per submission. So, in many tasks, if the input is small, then you have, you have to make sure that the, the whole input cannot be extracted in this way. So, the solution is usually to limit the precision of the data given in, in the feedback, like don't give detailed time and memory spent by the solution, and also to limit the total number of possible submissions. Also, we can randomize the test cases and so on. There are also some leaks via the prop file system, but these are not, not too important. So, and then and we also have some issues with introducing new languages. People often, often want to have new languages like Python available in the contests, but the problem is that most of these languages are much slower than C++. So it's often suggested that the time and memory limits be made per language. But this is very dangerous because, for example, you can write a C++ program and compile it and then embed the resulting executable file in a Python program. And when this Python program is run, it extracts this executable and runs it. So voila, we have C++ solution with a Python time limit. Of course, you can try to forbid this in the contest rules, but actually it's quite hard to specify some well-defined hard boundaries on behavior like this. So it's, it's, it probably doesn't have an easy solution. Finally, you can take some advantage from running multiple threads. At the first sight, it gives no advantage since the time limit is just on the sum of runtime on all the threads. But actually, in some cases, multiple threads can be used to increase the effective cache size if different threads are, are run on different processors or cores. So the solution is easy. You use CPU pinning provided by the Linux kernel to pin the whole solution to a single core so that all the threads are just short time on a single core. Also, there were recently discovered many security bugs in processors, but actually almost all of these are well mitigated by the operating system at some cost to uh, speed. So as long as the gator uses proper, proper separation of things to processes, the interprocess boundary is still enforced by the operating system. 
So then these bugs are not really an issue. There were also some historical attacks mentioned in the Forish's paper, but uh, these are mostly not an issue in current, current systems, in current Linux kernels and current namespace-based sandboxes like Isolatus at the IOI. So that was the overview of what we consider to be the most critical attacks on contest systems. And I would like to summarize some recommendations. First of all, use modern sandboxing technologies based on namespaces instead of, instead of P-trace based sandboxes, which were used in the history. At, uh, um, in all cases, place no security boundaries within a single process. These are impossible to defend, especially with the recent CPU bugs. You should keep your sandboxes tight, use sandboxes for both running the solutions and compiling it, and always think what really has to be available in such sandbox. And of course, place limit on all resources you can, including not only time and memory, but also disk space, number of processes, and similar. So thanks for your attention. Do you have any questions? Thanks, Martin. Let's know oh, one comment coming. Yes, this is a, one com any, uh, on this in correlation with, ah, no, I want to ask what happens is SMS introduces random order listing of test case in feedback. The amount of information about test cases for each submission can be hard to get. Uh, yes, it's definitely much harder to exploit in this case, but, well, it, um, it depends on how similar the test cases are. If you have, for example, a set of test cases for a single subtask of a task, and all these test cases share some property, then this property could be possible to extract using the feedback. But of course, this makes getting concrete test inputs much harder. And one more question is, any comments on these in correlation with SMS? Are these all addressed in SMS? In, in CMS? Well, CMS use, uses the isolate sandbox, so most of the issues are already handled by the sandbox. But of course, especially the security boundaries within the process, shared by the greater code and the, the contestants code are, are real in CMS, but it depends on the design of the particular task. And at this IOA, uh, we were trying hard to avoid insecure solutions of this, of this kind. But generally, it's a problem. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. So thanks for attention. And goodbye. Yeah, and now we have, we would like to invite Marina Tsvetkova and Vladimir Kiryuhin from Moscow, Algorithmic Thinking and New Digital Literacy. It's okay. Uh, hi. I think that all is uh, uh, very good and uh, good health in this difficult time. And now I want to start and describe about uh, discuss problem. Uh, what is uh, the algorithmic thinking and what is of course and uh, what is uh, the uh, computer uh, computing thing thinking uh, these uh, two aspects in aspects in uh, our educational system in the school 
uh, was discussed, and I think that is uh, uh, not a problem because uh, algorithmic thinking and uh, computer thinking is a two side of one middle. Why I? Uh, yes. Uh, why I think about this? Uh, uh, because um, uh, in uh, 20 uh, age, uh, many scientists uh, call about algorithm, program, uh, computer science, um, IT, and others. But uh, these uh, positions describe not Mm, with uh, additional, uh, with uh, informatics uh, in the school. We know that uh, algorithmic thinking uh, and uh, computer uh, thinking set programming uh, show the high school, the professional education, but not including to the uh, all kids in the school and primary school to it's uh, will be uh, this uh, uh, it was a very problem situation uh, but now we understand that algorithmic thinking and uh, computer thinking as uh, uh, additional position include in uh, school education uh, from uh, early age in primary school, and uh, we have any question what uh, we must do for uh, the good education in uh, computer science for the kids, and uh, what uh, goal, uh, what goal, uh, why we do it, uh, why we learn, learning to. Uh, uh, algorithm and programming at primary school, for example, or uh, base school, and uh, what result we wait from uh, this education. I think we understand that our uh, world now is a world including more and more program programs. This is a Programming world and uh, um, modern kids understand it, and the modern kids won't use it. But uh, not all teacher uh, won't do it, <laughs> and uh, I know that the good school uh, education in informatics is a base. Uh, basis uh, for uh, the um, success of our kids in uh, Olympiad informatics, in professional sphere in the future. Um, uh, in Academy Yershov and uh, uh, Professor Papert in the uh, 20th century uh, discuss uh, this new uh, position in educational, which is algorithmic thinking. This is mathematic or informatic. And what is this, what is computer thinking? This is only informatics or including to all subjects in the school curriculum. I think that uh, we um, have not uh, problems and uh, um, separate this uh, uh, definition because algorithm thinking <laughs> exists uh, uh, many, many thousands years. Computer thinking uh, was born in 20th century after uh, computer as phenomenon of uh, our civilization. But algorithm thinking this is a intellectual intellectual instrument uh, tools for uh, thinking uh, our 
kids too, but not only professionals here. Yeah. And computer, computer, computer thinking now is include uh, to all subjects in the school, all subjects, because computer is not only tool, uh, activity, students with the computer include uh, understanding what uh, I do, what I want uh, implement implemented my idea, uh, what I want to do uh, for with computer for uh, the solution, uh, my idea in a practice. And uh, in this slide, I show that we have uh, step by step uh, develop uh, our uh, understanding what is the computer thinking. Algorithm thinking is a basic basis for uh, uh, abstract thinking and uh, was, was um, created as a mathematic activity uh, and uh, uh, creative um, formed idea uh, of uh, our kids. But computer thinking is a practical basis uh, for the implementation uh, algorithmic thinking in the artifact of digital activity as digital literacy. Algorithm, computer, and program. This is a triangle of um, our understanding what we must learn in informatics in the school as fundamentation according of this subject. Uh, but uh, the kids uh, not live not only in a school in learning. The kids live in the digital uh, space and kids live in the society, uh, virtual society too, and uh, uh, between uh, uh, any uh, different uh, resources of the digital sphere. But each resource of digital sphere is program and uh, we understand that kids in early age uh, must know that uh, digital sphere include many uh, more and more programs and uh, basis in algorithmic thinking and basis in the uh, action uh, with the algorithm and program uh, with computer as computer thinking tool. Digital world now is a reality uh, for kids and uh, not a reality for the older teachers and uh, this problem we have now, but uh, after 20, 30 years, we uh, will uh, have uh, any problem because after this time, uh, we have new uh, technology, IT, digital um, technology, and uh, kids now <laughs> will in the future uh, not very, very modern in uh, modern IT in the future. It's a very important problem because we go step by step uh, to uh, new and new uh, IT in the world. Program and algorithm is a uh, corn of uh, understanding what is uh, school informatics. But we know that good school informatics in country uh, is guarant the successful uh, kids in professional sphere in IT sphere. It's very important because uh, without algorithmic uh, thinking, we uh, don't know as we uh, create uh, our idea uh, and, really, uh, and implement our idea 
in computer sphere as in a practice in a future professional sphere. But uh, Tringle uh, included digital information, digital devices, digital communication. And uh, digital information uh, included uh, position of uh, computer science, uh, digital devices included the position of um, computer engineering, and digital communication included the position of uh, digital society. It's Tringle uh, now uh, include in uh, curriculum in informatics school, I think, in each country. Uh, but uh, what accent? What accent we have in this uh, curriculum? This is the choice of each country too. Uh, competence, IT competence, digital competence, uh, always include three positions: uh, know to be able and uh, uh, use in the learning and in the professional creativity. This, three uh, this is the three positions uh, include in inf uh, digital, informati uh, digital information, digital devices, and uh, digital uh, communication too. Uh, but now we had management uh, platform in, ed in education, uh, and uh, this platform includes uh, very interesting new IT, uh, virtual reality, big data, smart devices, and uh, processes. And this is a new intelligent mentality uh, in uh, our kids in the future. And we uh, can uh, see uh, that uh, we have two uh, additional uh, sphere of the uh, digital literacy, uh, thinking procedure and uh, operation tools, theory and practice. This is a classic of education, but in IT, uh, use this too. I think um, in our paper, we show uh, any example what start up algorithmic thinking and what start up the first IT activity in computer thinking for uh, our kids. In, the, the, in Russia, we have the book, uh, copy book for the kids uh, with tasks, um, uh, intelligent tasks of, uh, in algorithm and uh, computer thinking. For example, and these tasks uh, we show as a uh, box with the understanding that the center is algorithm and input uh, the uh, data, structure, information uh, for the solution and output, uh, the goal uh, for the implementation, our idea. All tasks we can uh, show in this format, form, and uh, I think uh, this is very, very uh, simple for understanding our kids in uh, seven, uh, eight, eight. But I um, think that if we do uh, start up with algorithmic thinking, we go to the computer and to the uh, practice in IT programming uh, resources uh, with algorithm thinking too, we uh, have a very, very good result. And uh, kids in uh, 10, 12, uh, 14 years old uh, show a uh, um, very good result in uh, creating and uh, in uh, the Olympiad Informatics too, but not only Olympiad Informatics and uh, other competition uh, in IT sphere, 
Uh, but this is a guarantee for uh, develop for our kids in informatics. And I think that school informatics curriculum uh, must include this position, algorithmic thinking and computer thinking as a basis of uh, this subject and uh, activity our kids in all subjects uh, as an uh, instrument uh, for uh, uh, creative activity. Thank you. I think uh, that our paper uh, describes more uh, our ideas. Thank you, Marina. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, so no no questions i see uh, in chats there are some conversations about other presentations uh, i would say that uh, david gina just uh, sent me a message that uh, he couldn't manage to to join us and he really apologized ii community but uh, he invited to read his paper about self-generated figures in sequence processing. It's a really interesting paper with nice examples. So now it is time to close our conference and thanks for participation. Thanks to be with us. We were like around 60 people. So it is quite, quite good. And uh, so, if you wish, you can read papers, all papers on, that are on the website. And who would like to get hard copies, I already sent by email. Just send me your post address and I will send to you hard copies of the 15 volume. So this is some celebration, already 15 years of our conference. And hope to meet next year on site in Indonesia. So, Professor Santek, would you like to say some of, of closing? Valentina, thank you. Great thank you for you, uh, because uh, this work is very, very important for coaches and for teachers in informatics in the world. Thank you very much. Okay, um, yeah, uh, thank you everybody for attending this uh, uh, conference. As I said at the beginning of the uh, event, uh, we try to bring normalcy to the event. So IOI conference is one of the things that we attempt. But of course, this is still under the COVID pandemic. So we really try our best to do social distancing. Uh, a room can occupy, we, we, we have this room for 500 people and we have 60 over people. So I think we actually put in two meters um, <laughs> between each of us. Anyway, uh, thank you very much and uh, really appreciate your uh, presence. And also thank you all the presenter for presenting your paper and uh, uh, contribute to the success of this uh, online uh, IOI conference. Thank you very much and uh, good night from Singapore. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to say that uh, certificates, you will get, uh, all presenters will get certificates, so they will be sent to you, to your email addresses as PDF files. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs>